Hello, and welcome to the United States Equal Employment Opportunity Commission's National Interagency Partnership Event for Native American and Tribal Communities. My name is Kiesla Race. I am the National Partnership and Initiatives Program Manager at the EEOC. I will be hosting today's event. Today, we will hear from three agencies, federal agencies. We have a great show of federal leadership. We will hear from the chair at the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, as well as the Assistant Attorney General from the Department of Justice for Civil Rights. And we will also hear from the Office of Federal Contract and Compliance Program's Deputy Director. Our first speaker today will be Chair Burroughs. Before she gets started, I would like to give you some background. Chair Burroughs has numerous accomplishments. I will point out a few uh, for today's meeting. She, served as, she now serves as the chair of the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission and was appointed by the Biden administration. Prior to serving as chair, Chair Burroughs served as a commissioner at the EEOC for about six years. Under the prior administration, she was renominated in 2019, and the Senate ununanimously confirmed her to a second term. Prior to her appointment to the EEOC, Chair Burroughs served in several leadership roles at the U.S. Department of Justice, including working with the Department of Justice Office of Tribal Justice. She also served as general counsel for civil and constitutional rights to Senator Edward Kennedy on the Senate Judiciary Committee and later on the Senate Committee on Health, Education, and Labor and Pensions. During her time on Capitol Hill, she worked on a variety of legislative initiatives, including the Lilly Ledbetter Pay Act, of 2009 and the Americans with Disabilities Act in 2008. These are laws that are enforced by the EEOC today. While at the Department of Justice, Chair Burroughs visited reservations and worked in the interests of tribes as part of her work. During her tenure at the EEOC, Chair Burroughs has supported and championed the EEOC's partnerships with tribal employment relation offices and the tribes. She's led change in that our state and local office has been changed to state, local, and tribal programs. Chair Burroughs has recently served as a speaker at the Council for Tribal Employment Rights at their national convention. And most recently, she has led our efforts with the EEOC to engage in our first tribal consultation, consultations with tribal leaders. Please welcome the distinguished and esteemed chair of the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, Charlotte A. Burroughs. And Kisla, thank you so much for that really generous introduction. I am so excited to welcome all of you today and to be able to have uh, take part in this very important conversation. I wanna thank in particular our agency partners with the Department of Justice, and the Department of Labor's Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs for joining us today. It is uh, fantastic to be joined in particular by my friend and colleague, Kristen Clark from the Department of Justice Civil Rights Division and uh, Teresa Lujan from OFCCP. I am really grateful also to Cheryl Mabry, the EEOC's Director of State, Local and Tribal Programs, as well as Lucy Rosas, who is on my staff and oversees tribal matters for my office. I was deeply honored and uh, humbled to be appointed by President Biden on Inauguration Day as chair of the EEOC. And as you may know, this agency was the bipartisan federal agency created by the landmark uh, Civil Rights Act of 1964. And it was created in direct response for the calls for justice and equality at the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in 1963. It's also the leading federal agency charged with enforcing uh, employment discrimination laws based on race, color, sex, including pregnancy, sexual orientation, and gender identity, national origin, religion, disability, age, and genetic information. But fundamentally, this agency's role is to help finally make real the promise of equal justice that was one of the founding principles of our country. And that promise, while it was never realized, has also never been forgotten. And it's at the center of everything that we do at the EEOC, including our work 
with respect to tribal justice and supporting tribal nations in their employment rights. Um, when he addressed the National Conference of American Indians earlier this year, President Biden acknowledged the reality that from health disparities to gaps in economic opportunities, Tribal nations still live and still thrive in the shadow of a long and really painful legacy of broken promises. But at that conference, he also committed to write a new and better chapter in the history of our nation to nation relationship. And that is something that we at the EOC take very seriously. My hope is that in this new role as chair, together we can help write this new better chapter in the area of equal employment opportunities. And I have no doubt that um, those promises still carry really weighty significance uh, as a descendant of people who provided slave labor for generations in the American South. I certainly know what it means to live in the shadow of historical injustice. But I also know that history does not need to dictate the future. And so we are very enthusiastically looking at our work and partnering with tribal nations and also reaching out to figure out how we can best serve Native American people in Indian country and elsewhere to um, really make that promise a reality. And I think that um, over the past year, this country has struggled to come to terms with the really deep seated racial divisions that exist in our country today. More than a year after the brutal murder of George Floyd, our nation continues to grapple with those racial inequalities that are part of our national story. And that really, um, that events, other shameful acts of violence against persons of color of all demographic groups has brought to the forefront, not just those issues of systemic discrimination and criminal in the criminal justice system, but also more broadly systemic uh, discrimination in the area of employment and economic inequality. And it, so we are very focused on that, as well as on the severity of the COVID-19 <laughs> pandemic, which has become, and this is certainly true for um, those in Indian country, but across this country, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed and really intensified existing racial and economic inequalities in our society. And the pandemic has proven to be a civil rights crisis in addition to a crisis of public health and economic crisis. Um, it's health and economic fallout have disproportionately impacted people of color, women, older workers, individuals with disabilities, and yes, Native Americans. That impact has very serious implications in the workplace. The economic effects of that have been hard and we are very much aware of it, particularly in Indian country and aware of the need for jobs and the importance of the work that we do in this agency to address it. Um, I was just at the Coeur d'Alene Reservation uh, in Idaho and like so many other parts of Indian country and, and other parts of uh, you know Native, Native American communities that uh, COVID-19 has been a reality there. The Civil Center for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC, reported that American Indian and Alaska Native people have suffered disproportionately under the burden of COVID-19, both in terms of illness and, sadly, infections, hospitalization, and death. Um, and that study found that the historical trauma and persisting racial inequality contributed to disparities in health and socioeconomic factors between American Indians and Alaska Natives on the one hand and white populations on the other. And so we have been looking at the commission at how we can be helpful in supporting the tribal employment rights offices, our partners, um, as in ensuring that there are jobs and, and dealing with this in the aftermath and as the pandemic continues. Um, when I became chair, I thought it was urgent to look at that. And so back in April, we had a commission hearing, our very first virtual, all virtual public hearing to look at the civil rights challenges arising from the pandemic. We heard from experts, including Professor Eric Henson, a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation, about the pandemic's impact on workers. 
the difficulties that have been faced in Indian country and by tribal nations struggling to protect their populations and also deal with the economic realities of having to close tribal businesses um, in the wake of the pandemic. And so there are a number of challenges, civil rights challenges. I will say that we also have a lot of very significant cases coming out of Indian country that are so important for us to address. Um, the, one of the things that is enormously valuable to us and to me as chair personally is our partnership with tribal organizations and with other federal agencies that can help us to seize the opportunity to look at these challenges and see them as a potential to do better with respect to uh, both our tribal to, uh, uh, relationship with the tribes, but also more broadly as individuals and as agencies. And so I think in particular with the opportunity that are opportunities presented by the infrastructure bill uh, that is moving through Congress um, has, has been recently passed in the Senate, we, there will be new job opportunities and also areas for us to focus. I wanted to share with you just a little bit about what we've been doing and why I think this is so important. We at the commission have just finished our first ever tribal uh, consultation process. Uh, we are focusing on getting a formal process and have uh, really been grateful to the tribes, tribal nations for their input, as well as the tribal employment rights offices as they have commented on how best to reach and cooperate with all of you. And I will say as well that one of the reasons why that's so important is that we know we have to do a better job of reaching you in the um, where you are and hearing from those pro the problems that may be facing um, tribal nations, facing tribal members, folks on or off the reservation that there is a real need for us to find those cases because we know that there is um, a difficulty, particularly during the pandemic in finding us. I'd like to tell you about just a few of these cases um, so that you understand why I feel so strongly about making sure we're accessible. I'll start with an investigation that we, where we partnered with the Department of Justice and it involved the South Dakota Department of Social Services. Our investigation revealed that that state systemically uh, discriminated against Native Americans who applied for jobs at the office, the very office that was dedicated to serve the Pine Ridge Reservation. So you have the Department of Social Services in an office that's supposed to serve um, a reservation that very much needed their help. Um, and you would have thought that that agency would have been eager to have uh, Native Americans on board, but instead they have, they repeatedly rejected qualified Native Americans for jobs at that very office. And we found that although 40% of applicants were Native Americans, the agency hired 11 non-Natives and just one Native American in the period of our investigation. And we learned about that from a highly educated member of the Ogla, Ogallala Sioux Tribe, well-educated, highly qualified, passed over for a position in favor of a much less well-qualified white applicant who was mysteriously hired just one day after the state agency closed the job vacancy and then reopened it briefly in order to select this individual. Um, we have had in addition, so that case we were, I will just close by saying we were so fortunate to have our friends and colleagues at the Department of Justice take that case to trial and win a really significant settlement that not only got relief in terms of monetary relief for the individual applicants, but changes to the way that that employer did business, which are so valuable. Uh, many of our cases involve racial harassment against Native Americans, such as our case in Casper, Wyoming, EEOC v. DART, energy company, which was the commissioned was ultimately we were able to settle it for $1.2 million, but it's illustrative of the kinds of problems we see. And it was a member of the Eastern Shoshone tribe asked on his very first day of work, how he liked living in Riverton and excuse me, but I will, we'll quote it. Um, 
with all the drunken Indians. And it progressed from there with constant harassments, uh, offensive terminology, disparate treatment, discipline, and those who complained were fired. So all of these things um, are really important for us to be able to find. And we are in the process of learning better uh, and learning more from all of you about how to find those cases, how to do outreach and to be as effective as we possibly can. So I am so thrilled to be here with you. I will stop there, but wanted to tell you how enthusiastically we are looking at our work in this area and very, very happy to hear from you. I regret that I will not be able to stay for the entire program, but wanted to welcome you and also introduce my colleagues here with the commission. So we are eager to uh, you know, partner with you in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Our next speaker is going to be from the Department of Justice. I would like to uh, give you some background. Uh, she is the Assistant Attorney General. Her name is Kristen Clark. Uh, Ms. Clark is the Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Rights Department of, excuse me, for the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice. In this role, she leads the Justice Department's broad federal and civil rights enforcement efforts and works to uphold the civil and constitutional rights of all who live in America. Assistant Attorney General Clark is a lifelong civil rights lawyer who has spent her entire career in public service. So he will go over um, many things in terms of her career and the things that she's done, but we are fortunate to have her here today as a strong show of leadership from the EEOC and the DOJ and soon OFCCP. I'd like to introduce you to the Assistant Attorney General, Kristen Clark. Thank you so much uh, for that kind introduction, uh, Ms. Race. I am pleased to be speaking with you today. Uh, I wish that we could gather in person, but I'm so grateful that we at least have this opportunity to come together virtually. I hope that the Civil Rights Division's participation in today's event conveys what I know to be true, that issues affecting the Native American community are top priorities for the Department of Justice. I want to ensure that Native American communities across our country are seen and heard as we work to enforce our nation's federal civil rights laws. First, we should acknowledge that the relationship between the United States federal government and Native Americans is a long history. And as Chair Burroughs observed, the United States has not always lived up to its promises or its ideals. So I recognize that when federal employees, even those of us in the civil rights community, show up and say that we're here to help, that there are many Native Americans and tribes who bring some degree of skepticism to the table. This administration is committed to overcoming that uh, skepticism and building trust. And to further that goal, we want to have ongoing open dialogues like the one we're having today to establish a relationship that is built on trust. And of course, we know that part of how we build trust is by listening and learning and by bringing civil rights enforcement actions and lawsuit, lawsuits to help show our commitment to promoting equal justice for all, including the Native American community. To that end, my colleagues from the Civil Rights Division's Indian Working Group will provide an overview of some of our recent enforcement actions during the second part of today's meeting. You'll hear more about the lawsuit that Chair Burroughs referenced involving South Dakota's Department of Social Services. As noted, we allege that the state was discriminating against Native Americans who were applying for jobs as social workers on the Pine Ridge Reservation. And in the end, uh, the more than 50 Native American job applicants who'd been denied jobs were able to share an award of over $350,000. Additionally, through the consent decree that we put in place, we obtained court supervision of the agency's hiring process to go forward to help establish a system to prevent future discrimination against Native Americans. And we know that there's more work to do. This case is a powerful example of the importance of outreach efforts. Without outreach and without hearing from communities like yours, we would not be able to identify problems worthy of potential federal enforcement. 
Second, I hope that today's event will help make the Civil Rights Division and all of the federal government more accessible to those in the Native American community who are seeking our help. I'm pleased that the EEOC invited the Department of Labor's uh, Office of Federal Contract Compliance, Compliance Programs to the table today and the Civil Rights Division to participate in this event. All three of our agencies share a common commitment to racial justice, uh, but we each have different enforcement mechanisms to further that goal. And we recognize that sometimes it can be confusing to navigate. And we hope that you leave here with a better understanding about our jurisdiction, about the statutes that we enforce and the kinds of complaints that you can bring to each agency. We hope that meetings like this help clarify the role of the Civil Rights Division and the role that all of our federal partners play in redressing the problems that Native American communities are facing. I wanna take a quick moment to plug the Civil Rights Division's online portal, civilrights.justice.gov, civilrights.justice.gov, and we'll put it in the chat box as well. Please share that broadly. Uh, with the communities that you work with. We want to hear from you. We encourage you to submit complaints about potential civil rights violations for our review. As I close, I wanna recognize attorneys who are joining me today from the Civil Rights Division, uh, Charlotte Lambers, who specializes in disability rights, Chris Awad, who specializes in educational opportunities, and Jeff Morrison, who specializes in employment. Um, Charlotte, Chris, and Jeff serve on the Civil Rights Division's internal Indian working group, where they meet with staff across the division on a regular basis to discuss and promote civil rights enforcement on behalf of Native Americans. The working group's ongoing dialogue, just like this interagency dialogue that we're having today, helps ensure that we're using every tool in our arsenal to respond to potential problems. Thank you for participating in today's session. This will not be the last time that you hear from me and my colleagues. I look forward to hearing from you all. And I wanna turn the floor uh, now back over to my colleagues from the Civil Rights Division's Indian Working Group. Great, thank you, Assistant Attorney General Clark. We appreciate you and your time and your commitment to our uh, to this calls and also to support our um, event. Our next speaker is going to be um, more leadership and this will be from the Office of Federal Contract and Compliance Programs. We are, are um, she's joining us as the Deputy Director, uh, Maya Wagu, and just a little bit about her and her background uh, before she gets started. Uh, most recently, she served as the Director of Workplace Equality and Senior Counsel at the National Women's Law Center, where she developed and coordinated priorities and strategies for NWLC's workplace gender quality efforts. With a focus on low-paid workers, she led federal legislative and regulatory initiatives and, act and advocacy, stakeholder engagement, engaged in narrative shifts and cultural change efforts and impact litigation amicus briefs on, range of, on a range of workplace gender equality and economic security issues, including pay equality, harassment, and civil rights enforcement. Please join us in welcoming uh, Deputy Director Maya Ragu. Thank you so much and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you and with our other agency colleagues. The Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs, or OFCCP, because it is a mouthful, deeply values its partnerships with you, your communities, and the important work that you're doing across the country. And I look forward to continuing to build our relationships and learning from your expertise and experiences. It's a real honor to be part of OFCCP during this critical time for our country because it's one where we have a powerful opportunity to make progress in advancing workplace equity and access to good quality jobs as our economy begins to rebuild and to make sure that it is done in an equitable way. I'll give you a little bit of background about the agency and the work that we do. So OFCCP protects the rights of employees and job applicants of companies doing business with the federal government. 
we administer and enforce three equal employment opportunity mandates. Executive Order 11246, Section 503 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and the Vietnam Era Veterans Readjustment Assistance Act of 1974, or VEVRA. These mandates prohibit discrimination by federal contractors and subcontractors based on race, color, religion, sex, including pregnancy, sexual orientation, gender identity, national origin, disability, and status as a protected veteran. But in addition to these non-discrimination obligations, they also require contractors to take affirmative action to ensure equal opportunity in all aspects of employment. And that's part of what makes our agency and the work that we do special. Additionally, federal contractors and subcontractors are prohibited from taking adverse employment actions against applicants and employees for asking about, discussing, or sharing information about pay with each other. OFCCP determines whether a federal contractor has met these obligations either in response to a complaint or during a compliance evaluation. And compliance evaluations are really the majority of OFCCP's work. And there are two different types of contractors that we schedule for these compliance evaluations, supply and service contractors and construction contractors. And you'll hear a little bit more about that work later on from one of my colleagues. OFCCP's authority makes it especially well-placed and well-suited to focus on systemic barriers to employment opportunities, including in hiring, because through our compliance reviews, we're able to identify broader problems which can often go unaddressed or aren't raised in individual complaints. I'm proud to say that the agency has a significant history of working with Native American communities and tribal leaders. For over 40 years, OFCCP has respectfully supported tribal sovereignty, Indian preference, and the employment rights of Native Americans. So for instance, in 1979, OFCCP participated in a project to help tribes establish the Tribal Employment Rights Organizations, or TAROs. OFCCP provided training and technical assistance to support TARO representatives who were responsible for protecting employment rights on their respective reservations. In 1994, then Secretary of Labor Robert Reich presented the Exemplary Public Interest Contribution Award to the Council for Tribal Employment Rights. And in 2013, OCCP formally established the Indian and Native American Employment Rights Program, or INERP, to advance awareness of employment rights issues for Native American wage earners and job seekers who are employed or are seeking work with companies doing business with the federal government. So one of my colleagues here today, Teresa Lujan, will give you more information about INERP, but I wanted to give you some highlights right now about the work that it does. INERP provides compliance assistance to federal contractors on the permissible scope of implementing publicly announced policy for preference in employment for American Indians and Alaska Natives when federal contractors perform work on or near Indian reservations. And currently, INERP is reviewing our recently published list of 750 supply and service contractors that are scheduled for reviews to identify which of those companies are working on or near Indian reservations and tribal lands. We are also going to identify federal construction contractors that are doing work on or near Indian reservations. The goal is to provide contractors with Native American recruitment sources to educate contractors on the benefits of having an Indian preference policy and contact information for the local taros and tribal colleges and universities. We are committed to partnering with tribal colleges and universities and urban Indian centers to identify networking opportunities so that federal contractors can learn about the untapped pool of Native Americans who are pursuing post-secondary education or certifications. In doing this work, we also work with, um, in partnership with our sister agencies within the Department of Labor, including the Wage and Hour Division, the Women's Bureau, Office of Disability and Employment Policy, and many agencies within the Employment and Training Administration, including the Office of Apprenticeship and the Division of Indian and Native American Programs. And as you've already heard, we also have strong and valued partnerships with other federal agencies and enforcement agencies in the government, including some of those here today from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, Department of Justice, 
but also the Indian Health Service, Department of the Interior, and the Departments of Transportation, Commerce, and Agriculture. And the goal here is to share ideas and resources and coordinate in the development of policies and guidance that impact tribal nations and communities. OFCCP also supports the Department of Labor's efforts to act on recommendations from tribal leaders to improve its tribal consultation policy and process for communicating with tribal nations. In fact, OFCCP recently participated in a listening session with tribal leaders in April to discuss improving the Department of Labor's tribal consultation. So I'll just conclude by saying that we really look forward to your feedback on how our agency can improve our engagement, outreach, and partnerships with tribal nations and stakeholders, how we can proactively identify barriers to employment and opportunity with federal contractors, and how we can strengthen our enforcement of the laws that require contractors to ensure equal employment opportunity for all. Um, I'm sorry that I'm not going to be able to stay for the full program today, but I leave you in the very capable hands of my wonderful colleague, Teresa Lujan. Thank you so much, and I look forward to working with you further. Thank you, Deputy Director uh, Ragu. We appreciate your time and participation. And as, as stated, our next speaker is also from the Office of Federal Contract and Compliance Programs. She is the director of the Indian and Native American Employment Rights Program. I introduce you to Teresa Lujan. Thank you so much, Kisla, and welcome everyone uh, to this very important event that we're having today. It's not often that we uh, can get together in person, so I feel that these virtual events are the next best thing. We can have more people uh, be comfortable in their settings where they can ask questions and um, listen to the wonderful work that our agencies and departments are doing. Um, I would like to first let you know that OFCCP senior leadership is formally in place. Um, Jenny Yang is our OFCCP director. And she has come to us um, and previously served as the chair, vice chair, and commissioner of the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission from May 2013 to May or January 2018. Uh, so this is a wonderful opportunity to utilize Director Yang's expertise with EEOC while combining it with the work that we do in OFCCP. Our chief of staff is Darielle Rodriguez, and she joined us in February of 2021. And then we have uh, Deputy Director Ragu, which you um, just heard from, and we're very happy to have her. She's uh, here in OFCCP. She's been with, been with us for about a month and um, is busy uh, learning all of the aspects of the work that we do in OFCCP. And then finally, we have Michelle Hodge. Uh, for those of you who are from the Mid-Atlantic area around uh, Philadelphia and um, that particular area, we have Michelle Hodge, who was our regional director for the Mid-Atlantic region. She is now our career deputy director. So we're very fortunate to have a wonderful group of senior leaders ready to take on the role of um, see, overseeing what we do in OFCCP. As the director of the Indian and Native American Employment Rights Program, I get to work with so many different stakeholders in Indian country. And it is a pleasure to um, work with individuals um, on issues that they're having with contractors that are working on the reservations. Um, it's uh, just a very fulfilling job to have and a career to have. And it gives me the opportunity to learn some best practices from our tribal stakeholders on the best way um, we as an agency can serve uh, the communities. One of the areas that I would like to uh, first talk about is our enforcement data. And in this particular piece, uh, 
in FY 2020, we completed over 1,300 compliance evaluations. And during that period, um, we had settled 71 systemic discrimination cases. And out of that 71 um, cases, eight, eight of those involved um, Native American class members. We had over 270 class members and they received over $140,000 in back pay from the cases that we settled. And I'm very proud of the fact that the OFCCP field staff has been focusing on uh, the Native American workforce whether it, and applicants for positions with the federal contractors. Um, as uh, Deputy Director Raghu mentioned, I am looking at our um, new list of supply and service contractors that came out in March, and I am taking that list of the 750 federal contractors that are on the list, and I'm identifying where they are located and if they are located on or near an Indian reservation. Currently, I have over 100 federal contractors that I am going to be focusing on that um, do work on or near the Indian reservations. And in the next couple of weeks, I'll be notifying the regional directors and the district directors and the regional outreach coordinators that these are the contractors that I've identified and that so that they can focus on the, these particular contractors to identify whether or not they have an Indian preference program or if they would be interested in establishing one and if they are doing recruitment and outreach to the tribal communities near where they work. So now that I'm going to be focusing on these particular contractors, this will give me an idea of the not the work that the contractors do, but also um, how they interact with the tribal communities in the area. And that doesn't just mean that uh, there's 100 contractors that they're going to also have just my full attention. I'm also going to be concentrating on the contractors that have work near the tribal colleges and universities. I'm going to be looking for the contractors that do work um, in areas in the metropolitan areas where there are urban Indian centers and find out if they're doing recruitment in those particular areas. So this is going to be a lot of work that I'm going to be focusing on. But I, as many of you know me and know the work that I've been doing these years, I am truly committed to being an advocate for our Native American stakeholders. I feel like our 1% needs to be better represented in uh, federal agencies. And I feel that we should have a voice and be able to have someone to advocate on behalf of the the tribal members and um, individuals who are seeking employment or looking to have a gainful career with whether it's a private company or even with a federal agency. And I will give a plug that um, our agency I know will be starting to do quite a bit of hiring. So if anyone is interested, um, stay tuned and look at USA Jobs for Look, um, I'm sorry, something just came up on my screen here. Um, hold on one second. I'm having a technical difficulty. Okay, I'm not sure why this showed up. So um, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, we do have a good applicant pool, and I invite all of you to join and to be a part of the agency that for me has done so much for my career. Now I'd like to move on to some of the work that we're doing in OFCCP that does have an impact on our tribal communities. Um, we are committed to racial equality. Um, the Biden administration's emphasis on racial equality has um, provided OFCCP with the um, opportunity 
um, to reinvigorate its commitment to racial equality by protecting the workers and promoting diversity through equal employment opportunity and enforcing the contractual promise of affirmative action applicable to the federal contractors and subcontractors. Uh, President Biden issued um, an executive order advancing racial equality and support for underserved communities through the federal government. And this includes this includes um, an emphasis on working with the tribal communities. And you know, in the Department of Labor, we are working on formalizing our tribal consultation policy, and we're looking forward to um, taking the feedback that we've gotten from the tribal leaders and from other Native American stakeholders on how we can improve and better serve uh, the communities. Um, OCCP's work to advance equal employment opportunity and to eradicate systemic discrimination and racism is critical. We want to address these longstanding barriers that are embedded in many of the employment policies and practices of federal contractors. And um, for those of you who are participating today that are from the Taros, we have had many conversations about the contractors not wanting to hire individuals or hiring them, but not actually putting them to work because they, they feel like, well, we have to hire an X number of, a, of Native Americans from the tarot, but we don't have any jobs to put them on. So, you know, for me, they're, the contractors, they're not doing um, the employees any service by doing any type of training or anything like that. And so it's important that OSCCP utilize our field staff to identify where these policies and practices of the contractors are falling short when it comes to the work on or near Indian reservations. We are going to continuously work to tackle employment discrimination affecting all workers and we are going to really take advantage of the infrastructure bill and as the country rebuilds, we will partner with these federal contractors and subcontractors to ensure that their workplace is free from discrimination. That is something very important to us. And looking at where these contractors are working will give us an idea of how we need to move ahead to get these contractors to recruit in advance of actually starting work. We want this to be a long-term relationship with the contractor community and the tribal stakeholders. In the past year, many employers have stepped up to undertake um, efforts to work with uh, tribes. I have at least 25 federal contractors who have reached out to me that said, you know, we're interested in having a um, having an Indian preference program or an Indian preference component in our affirmative action plans. Most recently, um, the a company called Affordable Solar, um, they are interested in federal contractors but not have uh, been awarded a federal contractor yet, but they are voluntarily putting together an affirmative action plan that does have an Indian preference component. And I am working with them to develop this plan so when they do get government contracts, they'll be able to already have their plan in place and they're looking at um, doing outreach and recruitment to the Pueblos around the Albuquerque area. So um, if uh, Daryl Felipe, if you are, he is from the uh, Pueblo of Acoma and he is the terror director, um, we'll be in contact with you. So I'm looking forward to having that relationship start. Um, OFCCP is also committed to pay equity. Um, we want to ensure that compensation is ec equitable and it is a vital issue and a priority for us in our enforcement and compliance efforts. The agency is always looking for ways to um, advance pay equity for the federal contractors. This I find is a, an issue um, with the tribal communities where we have federal contractors either not paying an equitable rate of pay or they use a different scale just because they're working on or near an Indian reservation. We have to ensure that there is pay equity for everyone in 
in our um, in the way that individuals get paid. Sorry, there's getting a lot of things popping up here. All right, uh, significant gender pay gaps persist um, and have been persisting for a number of years. Um, pay gaps, particularly for women, um, women make up under half of the workforce in the United States and they represent nearly two-thirds or 60 percent of the workforce and they are the lowest paid typically than those uh, who are male and that that pay equity issue um, has to be addressed with our federal contractors. Our research shows that even when we control for factors such as education, occupation, industry, and work experience, significant gaps in earnings remain, not only for gender, but also for race and ethnicity. And those gaps cannot be explained by the federal contractors. And we want to make sure in, you know, through our mission that um, women and minorities are treated with equity both in employment and in compensation. OFCCP is also committed to the LGBTQ TQ plus community. Um, we are focusing on how we can further the Biden's pol Biden administration's policy to prevent and combat discrimination on the base of gender identity or sexual orientation and to fully enforce Title VII and other laws that prohibit discrimination on the basis of gender identity and sexual orientation, including overlapping forms of discrimination. In the past, um, INERP has worked with two-spirit communities to um, identify um, issues of discrimination that they are facing that are specific to their group. And we have um, done some research on the type of discrimination and in the two-spirit community, the discrimination once an individual leaves the reservation and comes into the metropolitan area, they do suffer significant discrimination. And those are this is an area that we're going to also be looking at when we do our compliance evaluations. And these are going to be the contractors that are working in the major metropolitan areas. So this is something that our compliance officers are going to be on the lookout for. Um, discrimination on the basis of gender identity or sexual orientation manifests differently for different individuals and it overlaps with the forms of prohibited discrimination including that of either race or disability. Disability is an area that um, we have done some research on uh, in relation to the tribal communities and how to ensure that individuals receive accommodations. And what I would like to see in OFCCP and how we can better serve the communities is to have a well-rounded focus on the laws that OFCCP enforces, the obligations of the federal contractors, and the impact that has on the Native American workforce and the job seekers. It's important that each of our offices look at how we can better serve our tribal communities. And this is now that we have our scheduling announcement list, we can focus on those contractors in advance of us actually scheduling them for a compliance review. And I know in Phoenix, where I currently reside, um, I work closely with the EEOC's Phoenix District Office, uh, specifically Krista Watson and Robin Campbell. And, um, you know, we do joint events together. And this is something that I'd like to see us continue to do um, in the Phoenix area so that we can focus on um, the tribes in this area and possibly even create a pilot that we could do with other offices across um, the U.S. where there is an EEOC and an OFCCP office. And so it's something that I think it's really important. I, I really enjoy working with Krista and with, um, with Robin. So I think this is a good way for us to continue this partnership that we have. 
And finally, um, I would like to point out that we do have our compliance assistance guides um, online. Um, these include our supply and service guides, construction guides, small contractor guides, educational institution guides, as well as all the postings that the contractors need to have available and that you can also review so that you know what the contractors are required to have. And then one final point, uh, as was mentioned, it is the um, new scheduling letter that we have for construction contractors. We're going to be scheduling contractors uh, who do um, construction work, and we're going to be conducting desk audits before we actually go on site now. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Kisla, and thank you all so much for your time. Thank you, Teresa. As you mentioned, our agencies continue to work together and it's at the national level, although we're hosting this event, we also have our 15 district offices with our outreach and education coordinators who work closely with the Department of Justice as well as OFCCP. And we will continue to work together and to find uh, creative ways to continue to reach and to support our Native American and tribal communities. Our next speakers are from the Department of Justice. Uh, we will be uh, hearing from Jeff Morrison. He is a senior trial attorney in the employment litigation section. We will also hear from uh, Charlotte Lambers, who is also a trial attorney in the disability rights section. And last but not least, we will hear from Chris Awad, who is another senior trial attorney in the education opportunities section. Welcome. Thank you. Can we move forward to the next slide? As, as was mentioned, uh, my name is Jeff Morrison. I am a, an attorney with the employment litigation section. You've got an attorney from three different sections here today. Um, we're gonna try and tell you about a few of the cases and matters that we've brought in or around Indian country. Um, we realize that, you know, the fact that you're having to talk to three, three different attorneys and that we're all in our own little niches is a little confusing. I will tell you that in the employment litigation section, our little niche is Title VII, race discrimination claims, actually also sex and other categories, but mainly race discrimination claims, just with public employers. So if you file a case and you get a case that is going against a private employer, that's the EOC, which is much larger than us, but if it's a small portion of the population that's public employers, that's the, the employment litigation section. Um, because we realize that those divisions are a little confusing from the outside, um, and all those specialties make it sometimes difficult to reach the right person, we have in the civil rights division an, an Indian working group. And the Indian working group meets regularly to discuss issues fa facing the Native American community and helping uh, people that come to us with issues sort out which of those sections should respond and who has the proper authority. Um, we also in the Indian Working Group have an ongoing relationship with the Navajo uh, Human Rights Commission. We have a, a memorandum of understanding that we meet with them regularly. And the Indian Working Group is always interested in reaching out to other tribal organizations, perhaps entering into similar relationships where we can have an ongoing dialogue Meet, meet with folks who bring us problems and help them sort through what we might be able to do about it. That being said, what I'm really here for is that uh, case that was mentioned a couple times uh, earlier on the uh, South Dakota social services was a case I was on the trial team for. And I wanna give you a little background about that case and possibly have the facts. Hopefully in the Q and A, we might be able to answer some questions if you wanna talk specifically about that case. If we go to the next slide. So here you have uh, the state of South Dakota, obviously. Um, what, what is sectioned off are the various uh, tribal entities and the reservation land. What we're talking about, of course, is Pine Ridge, which is down in the uh, southwest corner of uh, South Dakota in a pretty remote area. Frankly, you go to Rapid City and then you drive for a couple hours to get to Pine Ridge. Pine Ridge has a, uh, a social services uh, state office right in the middle of the reservation. That makes sense. The two uh, 
two counties that make up the Pine Ridge Reservation have to be among the top 10 count poorest counties in the country. Those are South Dakota residents, South Dakota citizens, so they are entitled to benefits. About 20% of the benefits in South Dakota flow through that one office on Pine Ridge. Um, as you can see, the office, Pine Ridge, is right there on the southern por portion of the state in a pretty uh, remote area. Um, what we found, thanks to someone who made a complaint to the EOC, and then the EOC conducted an investigation and sent the, uh, sent the case over to us for litigation, uh, what we found was that that office on that reservation was employing largely a white workforce that was coming in from neighboring Nebraska to the south and driving about 30 minutes coming up and working on the reservation as essentially social workers uh, for this particular office. If we go to the next slide. The problem with all these hiring cases, of course, is if you go and apply for a job and you don't get the job, you have no way of knowing whether you were discriminated against because of your race, right? Sometimes you might be a little suspicious. You're looking at an all white office in the middle of a reservation. You might very well be suspicious, but how do you prove that suspicion? What, what do you look at? You're just an individual. Well, fortunately for us, for, for the EOC pulled a lot of this data and then we pulled more when we got involved in the case and got it from the employer through the litigation process. We found out that over a seven year period, basically of that 60-40 split between white and Native American uh, resumes, applicants, um, you were about eight times as likely to get the job if you were white. Okay, that is potentially, you know, obviously those numbers are so alarming that you automatically go, wait a minute, wait a minute, but that's not going to prove a case. If we go to the next slide. So you expand that data out a little bit and you look at it, what you saw, what we saw, as you can see from this chart, is that the Native American applicants were coming in in equal numbers to be interviewed. In fact, they were slightly higher uh, proportion of the Native Americans, because of course they're local, they live on the reservation often for these applicants, and are right there. So they're getting a higher number of interviews from Native Americans, they're inviting them in, implying by the fact that they invited them for an interview where you've got your resume, that uh, they have the qualifications that they're looking for. For this particular job, the actual qualifications that were required were quite limited. Basically, you just needed a high school degree, but they stated that their preference was for people that had a college degree, preferably in social work, and had experience doing so social work type jobs. So we, we went through those resumes and went through all those applicants, but what you can see right, up, right off the bat is you were just as likely or more likely to get an interview if you were Native American, but once the force could see you, once they interviewed you, you actually, your odds of getting the job dropped again. Now you're about a one in 10 chance of getting the job after the interview phase. If we go to the next slide. Now, we, we dive deep into these numbers in these kind of hiring cases. And what you see is uh, a pattern over time. Why do we pick this seven to 2007 to 2013 time period? Well, that's where we saw the data, but what happens in 2014? In 2014, an interesting thing happened, which is someone complained, the EEOC showed up to investigate, pretty much right as soon as the EEOC showed up to investigate, the state adopted what they called a, a competency program, which was a way of reviewing these applications where someone basically in Sioux Falls had to approve the hiring. They had to send up the top three candidates. Suddenly you see a very different hiring pattern. You see the Native Americans and the white applicants are basically coming in at, you know, 70% or 75% are getting interviews and you've got almost exactly the equal chance of getting the job once, regardless of your race, that's race neutral hiring. Um, so at, at that point you see that the arguments that they couldn't have done this better kind of fall apart. Now that's only where we start and we dug into the individuals, right? And so the, as they told you, there were 50 plus uh, people who ultimately were part of our group who uh, shared in an award. They, uh, some of those folks were, you know, working as social workers in other, other states. They're working as social workers for the tribe. They were, they, we had four people that actually had graduate degrees in social work. 
Um, some of these people were highly qualified. And what we saw time and time again was sometimes when the highly qualified person applying was Native American and it was, it was abundantly clear in the applications, the uh, state of South Dakota would close the requisition and reopen it and then hire a white applicant. Um, so we brought this case, we, we litigated it, uh, we got a favorable ruling from a judge and then uh, resolved on the money damages. Uh, this case took quite a while to litigate. It was a very slow and intensive process. South Dakota fought us very hard. Um, we very much, uh, I, I believe the last person just received their check this year. Um, so this is the type of litigation that really kind of begs for the Department of Justice and our involvement because it would be very hard for a private plaintiff to bring this kind of litigation on their own because obviously there's a lot of analysis, there's a lot of numbers, there's a lot of folks to depose. Um, so hopefully uh, that will give you some information. If we have questions later, I'd love to answer. I'll hand it over to Charlotte now. Next slide, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Jeff explained earlier, I am a trial attorney in the disability rights section where we enforce the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, and the table on the slide essentially describes our enforcement practice. Um, like the employment litigation section, we exclusively enforce the Americans with Disabilities Act with respect to public employers. And by public, I mean state and local employers. Uh, for purposes of the ADA, Indian tribes are excluded from the definition of employer under the ADA. In addition, we enforce the ADA as to state and local entities. So this includes any state or local entity that may have operations on an Indian reservation, including public employers, as in the case of Pine Ridge, and police departments. It includes public hospitals. It includes education environments run by public entities. And it also includes polling places for purposes of elections, which I will offer an example of soon. Um, and then finally, it includes public accommodations, which essentially include any private entity that is open to the public. So private hospitals, movie theaters, restaurants, um, things that fall into that ambit. Next slide, please. So, so we don't have any recent examples of uh, cases involving the ADA against public employers implicating Native American communities. Um, but we do have a recent case involving inaccessible polling places in Coconino County, which is the country's second largest 
county if measured by size of geography in that it covers 18,000 square miles. It is home to the Grand Canyon and it is home to many parts of Indian reservations, um, including more than a dozen uh, polling places on Indian reservations. Um, the agreement essentially resolved inaccessible polling places that, that were the result of a department investigation that found various barriers to accessibility. Next slide, please. Those architectural barriers included inaccessible parking. Um, at times, what was happening on polling places in on Indian reservations entailed the failure of the county to pick polling places that had paved parking spaces. And so as a result of our agreement, the county agreed to pave various parking spaces at polling sites to ensure accessibility. In addition, there were numerous examples of ramps that were too steep and were therefore unsafe to people with disabilities um, and doors that were at times too narrow, making it dangerous or hard or impossible to get through an entrance and to cast a ballot. Um, under the agreement, the county agreed to remove these barriers and to make sure all of its polling places are accessible to individuals with disabilities in time for the 2020 November election. A lot of the improvements to accessibility involved temporary remedies that effectively are short-term solutions that render a polling place accessible for the purpose of an election. Um, and in addition, the agreement also required the county to train its poll workers on the obligations under the ADA. Next slide, please. I think if you hit space, the ADA symbol will appear here. Oh, perfect. Okay. Um, we encourage folks to take a look at our website at ada.gov. Um, there's a lot of information on there about the kind of enforcement work that we do. And we also invite you to file complaints on our website or to contact any of us um, about a problem that you observe or um, if you suspect a practice or an issue may be violating the ADA. We care about these issues and we want an opportunity to resolve them. Um, so thank you for your time. And I will pass the floor to my colleague, Chris, in, in educational opportunities. Thank you, Charlotte, for the pass off. Um, everyone, my name is Christopher Howard. I am an attorney in the education opportunity section. 
Um, some of you may be wondering why education is part of the employment discussion. Um, and so I wanted to point out to you that while our section does enforce federal laws to protect students from harassment and discrimination, that we often see a nexus in education between um, employment decisions and the impact that it has on students, um, such as you know, the teachers that are sent to the schools or the trainings that the teachers get, or even the resources that are available at the school, which create um, differences in which schools have which resources and teachers, et cetera. So I wanted to speak briefly about one of our cases that we had in McKinley, New Mexico, um, where in 2017, we entered into a volunteer agreement with the school district to address um, various concerns. Most notably was the fact that even though the district was about 80% Native American, that the, the gifted classes and honors classes and AP classes um, only contained about 25% Native American students. And so these low rates led us to ask additional questions to the district to see, hey, what's going on here? There's, there's a high percentage of Native American students in the district, but a very low percentage of them are actually taking advantage of or participating in these higher level courses. What we found was that um, some of the district's policies and procedures and employment had a direct impact on Native American students' participation in these programs. One of them was that in some of the schools, they were unable to find teachers that could actually provide, that could actually teach the courses. Um, and where they did have teachers, they didn't have the qualifications that were necessary in order to make sure that students were getting the education that they were required to by law. Um, so the district, in, a, in an, an effort to resolve this, initially offered live classes and remote in the remote reservation schools, but it wasn't enough. And so as part of our agreement, superintendent increased the staffing allocations for gifted teachers in all the schools in an effort to build capacity for students to participate in the gate and honors programs. In addition to, to address some of the remote locations of some of the schools, the district office also offered housing as an incentive to sign teachers and get them to be at the schools. So that was dealing with the employment practices as far as what the district was doing as far as hiring, recruitment, finding teachers that had the certifications and could actually speak some of the native languages. Um, and so while traditionally, when you think of employment, you may think of it as someone being discriminated against because of race, religion, et cetera, in the employment context, these decisions can also run into other areas. And so I wanted to speak so that when you are looking at issues, you do consider that they may cross a, a various realm of areas. And so as our, as our, as Kristen Clark spoke earlier about our website and filing a complaint, you can file a complaint with our website and it may cover various areas, whether it's employment, whether it's disability, whether it's housing, and we'll look at the complaint and figure out where it should go as far as which group. Um, and so the same thing in education, where if you feel that a school isn't receiving the same amount of resources as other schools, that could, that could affect the employment practice of that school. Because if teachers see that one school is getting professional development or resources or you know, laptops and better opportunities for promotion advancement than at other schools, where it has a certain student population of a, a, that may be considered racially identifiable, then those are things that we would look at and consider. Um, so going back to the Gallup-McKinley agreement, we noticed that as it related to resources that not all schools had gifted programs or had the teachers. We also noticed that as far as professional development, teachers weren't receiving the training that they needed in order to identify students who might be gifted or actually see what they could do to like um, assist parents in getting the resources to get their students the additional help or training so they could be in these programs. And as I stated earlier, the distribution of course offerings where some schools had honors classes and advanced placement classes while others did not. Um, and also we I mentioned that as far as teacher trainings where you wanted to make sure that all teachers are receiving access to 
the same opportunities. And if you have the schools on the remote that are more remote on, on the reservations, not getting the same, you know, fidelity of training, then that, that could also be considered discrimination in, in the context of student assignment. Um, so these are just some areas that we looked at. We wanted to make sure that you're aware of that even in education context, that there can be employment issues that come up that will affect students and whether they are receiving the equal, edu equal education opportunities that they're entitled to under the law. So on that, I think we'll go to the next slide. So as we all stated, this is our contact information. You are more than welcome to email us, Jeffrey Morrison, myself, Charlotte Landvers. And if you have a general question, we also have the website that we posted earlier dealing with if you need to file or want to file a civil rights complaint. Um, and we have people there that will funnel it to the right division and you will receive a follow-up call or email from someone. So we're here, we're here to help. If you have our information, just feel free to reach out to contact, contact us. And I think Jeff, not sure if you wanted to say anything further. No, that's great. Although I, I would say that uh, we do also have the Indian Working Group uh, has its own page and we have our own contact uh, email address so that you've heard a bunch of bunch of different ways to contact us. We've given you uh, our individual contacts. We've given you uh, the one, the complaint portal for the division. There's also an Indian Working Group and you can go online and you can get to us directly um, and contact us and we'll help you get to the right people. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so in our next speakers are going to be from the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. We will hear from Cheryl Mabry Thomas, who is the director of our state, local, and tribal programs. And you will also hear from uh, Lucy Rosas, who is a special assistant to our chair. Okay, thank you, Kisla. Uh, it's Cheryl Mabry these days. <laughs> um, so Happy, happy to be here with all of you, uh, especially our guests, not to ignore our EEOC staff who have connected today. Thank you all so much. Uh, but to our Taros and other tribal partners out there, as well as other federal partners out there, thank you all for uh, attending today. What I wanted to do was just make sure, I mean, you've heard from the chair of the EEOC, just we just wanted to make sure that we gave you a little more sort of an EEOC overview, really, really brief. Um, and then I'm going to I'll do that piece and I'll turn it over to Lucy to just talk a little bit more about our uh, tribal consultation work. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So the vision of the EEOC is respectful and inclusive workplaces with equal employment opportunity for all, with our mission being to prevent and remedy unlawful employment discrimination and advance oppor equal opportunity in all, I'm, Scott, I'm sorry, equal, oppor equal opportunity for all in the workplace. Now, unlike our partners who have joined us today, um, the EEOC is actually quite small, uh, independent federal agency. Uh, and we're led by our bi bipartisan commission. And again, you've heard from the leader of our agency, Chair Burroughs, today. If we could go to the next slide, please. And the EEOC, and I'm really going to zip through this, uh, but we're always here for you if you got any questions, folks. Uh, but we, we enforce Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, the Equal Pay Act, we also enforce the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Amendments Act that goes with that, as well as the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. And if you don't wanna to try to remember those, I'll ask you to go to the next slide. We always like to have at least a picture for folks. For If you're like me, the picture helps uh, more than the words a lot of times. We cover race discrimination, color discrimination, religious discrimination, 
national origin, disability discrimination. We also cover sex discrimination. And under the sex umbrella, we include pregnancy discrimination and issues pertaining to our LGBTQ plus communities. Um, and we also, the EEOC also covers age discrimination and again, genetic information discrimination as well. If we can move to the next slide, please. Now, EEOC, we're small, but we believe we're mighty. Um, and I think our record shows our mightiness. I hope people believe that. Uh, we, have, we have 15 districts across the US and they actually kind of get chopped up into 53 different offices. But as you can see, we are, we, we are we're everywhere. And for places we are not physically, uh, we do have our state, local and tribal partners who help us to cast that net even in those places. So next slide, please. So very simply put, um, EEOC, I like to say we're divided into a couple of sides of a house. On one side of the house, we call it our private sector side. That's where members of the public non-federal uh, can come to us to lodge their concerns. On that side of the house, we investigate cases, we mediate cases, if we find a violation of the law in a case and we're not able to resolve it through our conciliation stage, then our attorneys may actually litigate those cases as well. On the private side, we also develop regs and policy guidance that promote equal opportunity in the workplace. And we also provide training, technical assistance, outreach and education programs. And on the call today, we actually have several of our outreach and education coordinators that Kisla mentioned. I think a couple people did put their contact information in the chat. So please, you know, if you're looking to learn more, get someone to come out or to do something to help your organization or your group, please always our outreach and education coordinators are an incredible place to start. On the other side of our house, we have our federal sector. And that really uh, involves cases by, let's just, I'll simplify it, cases by federal employees, okay? So, but on that side of the house, we, we also provide leadership and guidance to all federal agencies and various aspects of EEO law. And then our administrative judges on the federal sector side of our house, they actually conduct hearings on EEO complaints from federal employees. And then also our commission adjudicates appeals from administrative decisions by federal agencies on the uh, EEO complaints as well. So if we could move on to the, um, to the next slide, please. So the department that, that I'm the director of right now is called the State, Local, and Tribal Programs Area uh, Department. And we are actually part of the EEOC's Office of Field Programs, which is the office that kind of oversees all of the work that's done in all of our field offices that you saw um, on our map of the United States. But state, local, and tribal programs, two two key components to our program. One is that we work with what we are, our fair employment practices agencies or our FIPAs. We work with them, we contract with them. Uh, they are the state or local organizations that actually do the same stuff we do under the employment umbrella. Uh, a lot of them do more than that, but uh, we contract with 91 FIPAs currently to again, they help us cast that wider net and we actually pay them to, um, you know, if we agree with their work, we pay them for uh, their work on the employment discrimination charges, assuming that we are in a dual file work sharing agreement type arrangement where, and what we do there, just to be clear, the charging parties out there or complainants out there, they need not go to both the state or local and the federal agency. They can come to EEOC or they can go to the FIPA and those charges would be considered dual filed. 
so that we are making sure their state claims and their federal claims are preserved, but we are being efficient with only one agency conducting the investigation. So that's one uh, part of uh, what the state local tribal programs works on with our FEPA partners. And then if you could go to the next slide, please. We also work with many of you who are on this event today. And again, thank you guys for coming. And that's our tribal employment rights offices. Uh, we partner with our tribal employment rights offices who really work uh, to protect the employment rights of Native Americans. And our tribal governments through their sovereign power, they have authority to require employers on the reservations to provide preference to Indians in employment and business opportunities. And they work hard to ensure that those preference requirements are met by those employers who are on reservation. In addition, the Tarot's and the EEOC, we partner to make sure, and we really try to partner to make sure that Native Americans know what their rights are uh, with other issues too, not just the Indian preference uh, requirement, but also other workplace issues like harassment, promotion, training, you know, many other issues. So we, we work together to make sure that tribal members both on or off reservation know what their rights are and know where they should go to seek assistance. Next slide, please. And now I'm gonna just, and I know that was really an overview in a nutshell, but I wanna transfer this over to Lu Lucy so she could tell you guys a little bit about the tribal consultation. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you, Cheryl. Yeah, and I will be just really brief. Um, as Chair Burroughs mentioned during in her remarks, um, we have began uh, consulting with the tribal nations as part of the um, President Biden's memorandum that he issued at the beginning of the year in January, which directed the federal agencies to um, submit a detailed plan of action in terms of how we were going to implement Executive Order 1375. Um, now, this is an executive order that dates back to the Clinton administration, and, and every um, administration since has reaffirmed what that executive order um, states, which is basically any time that the federal agencies are implementing any type of policy um, or regulation that's going to impact uh, a native uh, country, um, Indian you know, Indian tribe, we are to consult with them as nation to nation, uh, given the sovereignty that um, the, you know, Indian nations have. And so it's, it's a directive now that we are, um, has been reaffirmed and that requires us to have a plan of action in case any kind of regulation is going to be implemented, we must consult with the tribes. And so we have started those discussions. Um, the In April, uh, we coordinated with Department of Labor and conducted our first consultation with tribal leaders. Um, and you can go on to the next slide, please. As part of that consultation, we asked for input from the tribes and are working um, to review that input and also uh, to draft a proposed consultation process. And within that framework, you know, the EOC is committed to working with the Indian tribes in a way that it respects the self-government and sovereignty that that honors tribal treaties and other rights, and that also meets uh, federal government's tribal trust responsibilities. Um, we are also seeking to identify ways in which we can provide outreach and information and access to our services. And so, um, this, let, next slide, please. When we um, met with the tribal leaders, these are some of the questions that we asked. And, and ultimately, the goal is to um, identify ways that we can better 
communicate and partner with tribal nations and also ensure that we are respecting um, the sovereignty. And then lastly, ensure that tribal members are familiar with our services and can access us. And therefore, um, we hope by maybe September, I think it's our deadline, September, October, to be um, finalizing our consultation process and also then posting it on our website um, so that um, tribal members and tribal leaders are familiar with that process. And I'll just um, conclude there. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Cheryl. At this time, we would like to open uh, for question and answers from the audience. So please, if you can, um, at the lower part of your uh, screen, you'll see an opportunity to submit questions. And our speakers will hang tight to answer your questions. Okay. So one general question would be, um, and this is to all of our panelists, how would, um, how would anyone who is um, looking to file a complaint, how would they know when to come to the EEOC or when to go to justice or when to go to OFCCP? I can go ahead and start. Uh, for OFCCP, um, they would need to be either applying for or working for a government contractor. So that's that's the first piece. If they're not sure, they can contact our office and say, I'm not sure if I work for a government contractor. I can look them up on SAM.gov and then identify whether or not there's a government contract for that particular company or not. And if they are a government contractor, then we have to look to see if it's a class action. So if there are two or more individuals who are similarly situated, that they, um, then we would take their complaint because with the memorandum of understanding that we have with EEOC uh, under Title VII, we don't take our uh, and Executive Order 11246, um, we generally don't take individual complaints, we take class action complaints. Okay, and just to clarify in terms of what an MOU is, an MOU is just simply an agreement between uh, federal agencies in terms of how we receive information and share information with each other. And I'll pass this off to Justice. Yeah, and, and this is Jeff Morse again. Um, the, the interesting answer to the question of what should you do? I think I've been the victim of discrimination. I don't know who to go to. Um, we have set up all, the, all these portals and, and ways to do it. The real answer is you should contact the EOC first. Um, and I'm going to say that because the EOC handles investigations for Department of Justice as well. So if you go to the EEOC and they've got a great 1-800 number, they'll get you to their local office. They're, they're excellent at it. They will get you to an investigator who's an intake person. That person will walk you through it. Um, so if, if I'm actually giving someone advice, I would say call the EEOC. Now, if the EEOC looks at the case and thinks, it, it, well, obviously you're working for a public employer, they're going to they're gonna contact us. Um, they will sort that out, though, for you, and they're actually excellent at it. So... If I can, if I can make that pitch. Now, that being said, there are other kinds of jurisdiction, those big type cases, and that's part of the reason we talked about that social services. Obviously, the, that one came through a complaint through the EOC, but that 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 is hard for an individual to see, right? It's hard for you to know. I've been discriminated against in hiring. So, if you think there's some kind of systemic discrimination, if you think that there's some kind of issue, or you just need help sorting it out, you can contact us over at the Indian Working Group, and you can also file in general just by going to the Civil Rights Division's DOJ page. But I will tell you, the EOC is really good at this particular thing, and if you call them, you'll get a person, and that person will help you. And I'll just jump in here to say, yep, he's right, folks. Mm -hmm. um, we did have a slide with all of the EEOC contact information. If you could throw that up, or put some put it in a chat or something so our guests will have all of our all the ways they can contact us that'd be great right so what we will do um as a wrap up to the webinar 
what we will do is we will send uh, all of the attendees a list of everyone's contact information and any handouts that um, may have come up uh, that came through today to make sure that you all can uh, review any links and access uh, how to reach us. And as I mentioned before, um, with the EEOC, with our 15 district offices and our many outreach and education coordinators, um, there we have opportunity to reach you all over the country. Uh, specifically in terms of what I do, I am the uh, National Partnership uh, Program Manager. So I will be reaching out to uh, many of the urban Indian centers and tribal colleges and universities directly for us to work with you um, to develop uh, relationships and to continue this conversation, to hear from you in terms of the things that you would like for us to talk about so that when we set up future events specific to your needs and that we continue to be a partner with you, your community and the overall organizations that you support. Charlotte. Um, thank you. I just wanted to add really quickly that if the allegation does not involve employment, um, folks can file complaints directly with us. And so as it m might implicate Chris in educational opportunities or us in disability rights, which is essentially everything, um, you should feel free to either reach out to the Indian working group or to file complaints directly at our website. Um, it's always a good idea to always to also email us just to flag that you have filed a complaint because in our office we receive almost 20 thousand a year and so at times they can get lost in the in the shuffle of things like not lost permanently but it can be a lower process if they are not flagged immediately um so that's all i wanted to add but thank you everyone Thanks, Charlotte. And I, I just wanted to say thank you to our attendees, uh, to our tribal colleges and universities, our urban Indian centers, special thank you to our tribal employment relations offices, and to our uh, senior leadership, the strong show of senior leadership that came from the EEOC, the Department of Justice, and OFCCP. I think that it shows our strong commitment and interest ensuring that we strengthen our relationships and our connections with our Native American and tribal communities. We will continue to be committed and find ways for us to remain connected. So again, thank you for your time. This webinar will be recorded and it is recorded and it is going to be shared. So you will have an opportunity to, we will have an opportunity to reach those who may not have been able to attend live. So we thank you and appreciate your time.